hello to you wherever it is that you're linking in from today. As was mentioned, on this final Sunday of the year, we're beginning a brand new series that will take us all the way into the new year of 2024. Today and throughout January, we're going to be taking a look at some of the surprising and at times downright shocking teachings of Jesus. Things that Jesus said, which at the time would have left people going, he said what? when they first heard them. And things that might leave us responding in the exact same manner today. So I'm looking forward to it and I'm really excited to start this series today. A few years ago, my wife Zoe and I, along with her siblings, we wanted to get a thoughtful and one-of-a-kind gift for my father-in-law. And we found this website that allowed you to personalize different types of clothing by uploading a picture that could then be printed onto the fabric. And so we decided to order a couple of pairs of what was advertised as high quality business socks that had photos of all the grandkids printed on them. And unbeknownst to me, Zoe also ordered an extra pair of socks which featured a picture of my daughter, Nora, to give to me on what would be my first Father's Day. Now, when these socks were delivered, we very quickly realized that what had been advertised did not line up with the products that were delivered. They were the most uncomfortable pair of socks I'd ever worn. It literally looked like they just cut a tube of fabric and sewed it closed at one end for a sock. And the picture of the beautiful grandkids that was printed on this piece of fabric was of an equally low quality. So few pixels that it was hard to distinguish which kid was which. And when you pulled the socks on and the fabric stretched over the foot, these printed pictures became warped to the point that they looked like a food stain that had discolored on an old piece of clothing. Such are the perils of online shopping, where what is promised often does not align with what is delivered. Now, if you want some amusement, just Google online shopping fails and have a giggle at how so many others have had a similar experience, where expectation does not meet reality, when what seemed like a good opportunity or idea, it did not pan out as planned, when much is promised, but little is delivered. You know, as we find ourselves at the end of one year and the beginning of another, I wonder whether you might have a similar sentiment whether it's about life in general or any number of specific things in your life. It's such a unique time, isn't it? Where we can both look back in reflection on what's happened and also look forward with anticipation about what could happen. Perhaps this year has been fantastic, full of challenges, sure, but good nonetheless. Or perhaps this year has been really challenging or even the worst ever. Sure, there's been some good, but overall, it's been really hard. And as a new calendar year dawns on us, you might be filled with optimism, pessimism, or a whole range of other thoughts and feelings about what is to come. It's not uncommon at this time of the year to be all too aware of the good and the not so good in life. And perhaps one of the more underlying senses that many, if not all of us, have is that no matter how good things might have been this year, there's still a desire for more. Or no matter how hard things have been this year, there's still a hope for more. Well, in a world which promises a lot, but often delivers very little, we can be skeptical about people who make big promises about things that will really satisfy. But a long time ago, during a casual conversation by a well, Jesus did just that. And as we stand at this juncture between 2023 and 2024, we're going to look at what, at how what Jesus said and promised back then can bring perspective and hope in our life as well, no matter the circumstances of our past, present, or future. And so if you've got access to a Bible of your own, I'll get you to head along to John chapter 4, which is the passage that will be based in today. Now, in writing his account of Jesus' life, John, the gospel writer, recorded a number of things that Jesus said and did. And the ultimate hope that John had for anyone who would read what he wrote was this. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. 
You see, John, like so many others, believed that Jesus could change anyone's life forever. And as we enter the story of John chapter 4, we're going to see how an interaction that Jesus has with a woman leads to not only her life being changed, but also the lives of many others. As this story opens up in John 4, the scene is set for something extraordinary to happen. And so he, that's Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So here comes the first striking feature of this story. The fact that this woman comes to draw water in the middle of the day on her own, it gives us a hint that she's an outcast, isolated even within her own marginalized status in society. So this, combined with her ethnicity, gender, and the societal norms of Jesus' day, it all means that this conversation shouldn't even begin in the first place. This lady knows it. Everyone in her context would have known it. This conversation should not be happening. But regardless of all these barriers, Jesus intentionally initiates a conversation with her. And it's not just because he wanted a drink of water. Let's have a look at how Jesus responds to this woman's caution and reserve. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I wonder, have you ever found yourself in a conversation with someone and somewhere along the way you realize that the two of you are just speaking about two completely different things? Well, that seems to be what's happening right here. Try to imagine the moment from this woman's perspective. If we lived like she did in a hot and dry desert climate where getting water requires you to go to a well to draw it up, then water takes on a whole other value as a commodity. And if we were to hear Jesus' words about water like she did, we'd probably probably be thinking, I don't know, sounds a little too good to be true. I'll believe it when I see it. But from our unique view of this conversation... It becomes a little more clearer that Jesus is talking about water, not so much as a commodity, but rather as a metaphor for something more. The late Timothy Keller observed that what Jesus is essentially saying here is something along the lines of, I've got something for you that is as basic and necessary to you spiritually as water is to you physically. As Jesus continues to expand and unpack on this metaphor, he goes on to describe this living water which satisfies satisfies from the inside out. It's something that wells up from within and it brings a deep soul satisfaction. Something that enables contentment regardless of external circumstances. Another scholar simply describes this living water that leads to eternal life like this. Living water is life nourished by God. Jesus offers living water to this woman. It's life lived in relationship with God, life that is nourished by God and brings contentment and lasting satisfaction. This is the promise of living water, eternal life, that Jesus is offering this woman. However, as we continue in the passage, While it seems that what Jesus has said has resonated with her, for some reason it appears that there's still some disconnect between what Jesus is saying and what she's hearing. 
Because this is what she says. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So while interested, she's still thinking that Jesus is talking about water rather than the deeper longings and matters of the heart, which is what makes Jesus' next words to her so jarring but also clarifying in the process. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Now, although it might seem as if Jesus is suddenly changing the subject, he's not. Instead, Jesus is just giving her a gentle nudge, revealing to her that before she can understand the nature of the living water he's talking about, she first needs to recognize how she's been looking for contentment and satisfaction in the wrong places. In this instance, it's the five previous marriages that she's had, as well as her current relationship. Now, to be clear, Jesus is not shaming this lady for her history of relationships. God does not shame us for the areas of brokenness and dysfunction in our life either. But like Jesus is doing here, God does prod and address the often tender areas of our life where there is brokenness or dysfunction or disappointment. And he does this in order to reveal how our pursuits for satisfaction and contentment outside of God will always leave us lacking and wanting more. As we can see in this story, the firm but tender conversation Jesus has with this lady, it doesn't leave her feeling shamed. Rather, it leaves her in awe. Because Jesus knows and is speaking about things which could only come from God. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Now, the conversation that this woman and Jesus are having, it continues with a deep theological discussion about one of the most contentious religious questions of their day. And we simply do not have the time today to give it the attention that it deserves. But their conversation continues to bring fresh insight into how, through Jesus, a time is coming and has now come where anyone anywhere will be able to know God and experience the life that he has for them. Living water that fills the overflowing into all areas of life. And the conversation ends with this woman not quite knowing how to respond because of some questions that remain unanswered for her. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. So when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now in this moment, we have one of the first instances where Jesus reveals who he really is. He's not just a prophet or someone with a compelling insight from God. Instead, here, Jesus declares that he is God. And that he can give anyone and everyone living water that satisfies what the human soul longs for the most. A new quality of life. A life that is nourished by God because it is lived in relationship with God. And this is how Jesus reveals who he is to this woman at a well. Through a casual conversation, he both highlights how things went off track in her life and how he can give what her soul longs for the most, living water that satisfies so that she will never thirst. If you keep reading through the rest of John 4, you'll see how this Samaritan woman responds to this moment with Jesus. She leaves her water jar at the well, goes back into the town and tells everyone who will listen to her, I've just met someone who told me everything that I've ever done. I think I've just met the one that we've all been waiting for. Could Jesus be the Messiah? And here's how John records the response of the community to this marginalized woman's testimony about Jesus. 
Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. It's a remarkable reminder that Jesus' promise of living water, which wells up to eternal life, it doesn't just relate to and transforms her life. It overflows and it spreads to others as well. It's a profound promise that Jesus gave to her and then to her community. And it's a promise that Jesus gives to you and I today as well. Jesus promises living water, life that is nourished by God and truly satisfies. Can you imagine how that might influence or shape or transform your life today and in the year to come? Life that is nourished by God and truly satisfies so that you will never thirst. You know, just like that woman at the well, I think there can also be a couple of challenges or barriers, though, that make it hard for us to comprehend or experience what Jesus is talking about here. One of those challenges is when our focus remains fixed on the great many other things in life and this world that we look to or seek satisfaction and contentment in. For some of us, it might be a romance. Life will be good when I find the one or when the one becomes the person that I want them to become. It could be family. I'll be content when my kids become or achieve all that I've dreamed that they could be. It might relate to pursuing excellence, achievement or success in your studies, your career or even your retirement. I will be satisfied when this happens. For some of us, it may be centered around a particular political or social cause. I'll be content when this party retains or regains power or when this cause finally gets traction, support and the popular vote. Maybe it has something to do with our health, wealth or sense of well-being in any area or endeavor of life. When I get this or this gets better, all will be well. Now, none of these things that I've just mentioned are inherently wrong. In fact, many of them are generally good things to desire. But in and of themselves, they cannot and will not provide lasting satisfaction or bring ultimate contentment to what our souls ultimately thirst for. Is there something that you're pursuing in life hoping that it'll bring lasting satisfaction or contentment? If so, what might Jesus have to say about it in conversation with you? Now, that's one of the challenges to hearing, comprehending and experiencing what Jesus is talking about when our focus is fixated on the pursuit of other things. But another challenge relates to when we're uncomfortably aware of the mistakes we've made and the values that mark our life. Because it can be hard to hear or to receive words of hope when things seem hopeless. You know, perhaps you had in your mind that maybe 2023 was supposed to be the year that you finally achieved that goal or saw some success or finally kicked that harmful habit. Was it supposed to be the year that you started something, stopped something, or finally began to see some results? And yet what started with great optimism and energy it fell away into something more of a nightmare than a dream. 2023 was going to be the year that you, you fill in the blank. And whether it was because of things that you did or didn't do, or whether there were some things that were done to you or not done for you, maybe this year hasn't panned out as you had hoped. Whatever the case may be, Whenever our dysfunctions or wounds or disappointments are uncomfortably apparent to ourselves or others, it can be an almost impossible thought that Jesus' offer of living water 
might be something that's available to us. So whether it's because of a fixation on the pursuit of seemingly good things that will never truly satisfy, or whether it's because we feel ineligible because of failure, dysfunction, and disappointment, how do we hold on to or respond to Jesus' promise of living water and a life that will truly satisfy? Well, in the same way that a conversation with Jesus completely changed the perspective in life for the woman at the well, I'm convinced that Jesus is ready and willing to have similar conversations with you and I too. Conversations that can reveal where things went off track in our lives and how Jesus gives us what our soul longs for the most. There's different ways that this conversation can happen. God has a profound way of getting our attention and speaking to us, doesn't he? But what often seems to be the decisive factor is whether we're willing to listen and respond to what Jesus has to say. And so to finish, I want to frame up one way in which you might like to lean into conversation with Jesus today and into the year ahead. It's a practice of prayer that we've spoken about from time to time here at Sindel Baptist. And it's been something that followers of Jesus have been doing for over 500 years. It's commonly called the daily examine or prayer of examine. And it's a form of prayerful reflection. In other words, a conversation with Jesus that was popularized in 1522 with a Spanish guy called Ignatius of Loyola. Now at its core, the daily examine, it helps us to prayerfully reflect on what has happened in our life in order to discern what God might be saying to us or working in us. As the title suggests, the daily exam is intended to review the events of a particular day. But the beauty of it is that the general steps involved can relate just as much to a week, a month, or a year as it does for a day. Now, I typically do this on my drive home from work. Some days it might take me five minutes to do. Other days it's a little longer. Just like a conversation, some can be long and some can be short. But I've also found this practice of prayer to be helpful in reviewing and reflecting on more extended periods of time, a week, a month, a year, a stage of life. Now, over the centuries, the prayer of examine, it's been modified and adapted and presented in a whole range of different ways and with different terms. But the one that I found most helpful for me, at least it's the one that I can remember, it involves four simple steps that are guided by four simple words. Replay, rejoice, repent, and resolve. Here's what they mean in a little more detail. To start with, we replay or review what happened today, this week, or this year. And so you might think, what are some of the key moments that I can vividly remember? What are the conversations or experiences that I had? Who are the people that I saw or the places that I went to? Now, the level of detail, it might differ from day to day or week or year. But because this is a conversation with God, it might be helpful to ask God to bring to mind the things that matter the most. Might it be as simple as asking God, God, a lot of things have happened today or this week or this year. So God, what in particular do you want me to pay attention to? So that's the first step a replay or a review of what happened today, this week, or this year. And whatever it is that comes to mind helps frame the following three steps. Because the next one is where we rejoice or give thanks or express gratitude for the good that God has brought in our life. So you might be thinking, where did I notice God's grace, His favor, blessing, goodness today? Were there moments where I sensed God's presence with me? What was good? Think of them. Name them. And then we give thanks to God with gratitude for them. In the words of the famous hymn, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And that's exactly what we're doing in this step. Recognizing that everything that is good is a gift from God. So it might be recognizing and giving thanks to God for a good night's sleep a cup of coffee or food on the table, 
an encouraging text or email that you received, a poignant moment that you had while reading the Bible or listening to a song, a win at work or at home, for friends, family or community, for clothes on your back or a roof over your head. Big things, little things, all good things that ultimately comes from God. And a little reminders of how He nourishes our life spiritually, emotionally, and physically. You see, when we recognize instances of God's immeasurable goodness, when we're reminded again of His constant presence in our life, and when we rejoice or give Him thanks, it can powerfully transform our perspective in life, even when circumstances are dry, tough, or painful. Now, this leads to the third step, repent where we recognize the mistakes that we've made or the, gr- the regrets that we have, and we turn back to God. Where did I sin today? By commission or omission, by doing or pursuing things that aren't good, or by not doing and not pursuing things that are good. What were the thoughts, words, actions, or attitudes that I had today that I regret or feel convicted by or simply know aren't in line with God's will for my life? Was it an argument, a resentful thought, a moment of anger, apathy, or resentment, an avoidance of a person, a conversation, or a thought? You know, when we honestly approach this step in prayer, it's not in order to increase our sense of shame or condemnation. Instead, like Jesus did in his conversation with the woman at the well, it reveals the way in which things tend to go off track in our life. And it can lead to the pivot where we realign or turn back to Jesus who promises to provide what our souls long for the most. Oftentimes when I get to the end of this step, I'm aware of a couple of things that I need to ask for forgiveness and grace from God. God, I'm sorry for how I responded to that person or held on to that bitterness or anger or gave in to that temptation. God, I'm sorry. In your grace, would you forgive me? The other element of this step to repent is that I'm often also aware of a couple of things that I need to own or ask for forgiveness from others. And so repentance often leads to me at the end of the day needing to send a message or an email, making a call or bookmarking a conversation with someone in order to say sorry or to seek support. Now, it's this awareness of what a repentant response might look like that leads to the fourth step, where we resolve. Where we resolve to accept all that God has for me or us or you, becomingly, becoming increasingly faithful in all that I do and say. It's making that decision again and again and again to desire and to receive the living water that Jesus promises, life that is nourished by God and truly satisfies. It helps us view the good things that we pursue or have in life with the right perspective as good gifts from God. And it helps us to move on or begin again from our mistakes and our sins rather than to remain trapped or condemned by them. Now, as I said earlier, there's a lot of ways that we can have a conversation with God. And the prayer of examine is simply one of those ways. It helps me to review whatever has been going on in a particular day or other period of time. And it brings a renewed perspective and hope to what really matters the most. I found it to be a significant gift and practice in my own life because of the way it helps me to become increasingly aware of God's presence and activity in my life. And the more that happens, the more that I experience Jesus' promise of living water, life that is nourished by God. And so if you'd like to try on this practice for yourself, then go to our Connect link, me.sb.org.au and you'll find a PDF resource that outlines a couple of ways that you can do the prayer of examine in relation to your day or even as a way to review this year. Who knows? Maybe the prayer of examine could be something that you include as you seek to forge new paths and habits into the new year. But whatever your response might be, My hope and prayer is that in this coming year, you would experience the reality of Jesus' promise of living water, 
Life that is nourished by God and truly satisfies. Life that's lived in a relationship with God that is marked by ongoing conversation and an increasing sense of His presence with you. And so to finish, I want to pray and ask that God might initiate a conversation with each of us about the things that He wants to bring to our attention at the close of this year and at the beginning of another. So let's do that right now. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for the way in which you are present in this world and present in our lives. And in this time, I'm asking that you might speak to each of us, wherever we are, about whatever it is that you want to draw our attention to. God, would you remind us of your grace, your goodness and your provision in our lives. God, would you bring awareness to the things that draw our attention, our hearts, our loyalty away from you. And God, would you help us to turn to you, to return to you, and to keep our focus fixed on you and the life that you have for us. Loving God, would you speak to us? Would you lead us into deeper conversation with you? And would you help us increasingly experience life that is nourished by you and that truly satisfies. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.